Okay. Thank you, Miss Vigil. I think it's you who says this every time. It reminds me every time. You can just text me next time. Okay. All right. Quick review. Quick review of the um, autonomic nervous system. So now we're going to talk about medications that our bodies cannot control, such as breathing, blood pressure, pupils. And the medications I'm going to talk about within the next hour or so controls these things that our body cannot control consciously. So what are the bodily functions regulated by the autonomic nervous system? It's all right here. Your vital signs, heart rate, blood pressure, temperature. There's no way for us to control it unless, no, actually there's nothing. There's no way you can control it. Our body reacts to it. Other things that the autonomic nervous system controls, water balance, urine, water balance, urinary excretions, and digestive functions. You just pee, you just poop. It's just something that happens. Now that, now that you remember the um, autonomic nervous system, I'm also going to refresh your memory on the two branches of the ANS. First is the sympathetic, fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, rest and digest. Megan's waiting, is in the waiting room. Oh, I thought I'd let her in already. Okay, I let her in already. Megan's in. So these medications I'm gonna talk about will control either the sympathetic nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system. This is where they are located. You don't need to know about this. I keep having issues with this computer thing. Okay, we don't, you don't need to know about this unless you want to, the information is there. I'm not going to grill you um, to test you on this. I'm not gonna ask you where these things are in clinicals. What is this medication for? I'm not gonna ask you if it works in the peripheral nervous system or anywhere else, it's just there. So what happens? What happens when the sympathetic nervous system is turned on? What is happening here? Maybe I need a new battery for my mouse or something. Oh, please, having some technical difficulties. It's a mouse thing. Okay. So this is what happens when the sympathetic nervous system is turned on. Blood pressure, heart rate rises, respiratory increases, bronchi bronchi are dilated, pupils are dilated, erection that I had to look up. I thought it was something erotic, but it's just goosebumps, nothing exciting. And also blood is diverted from the GI tract and, the urine, and all the other internal organs. We are not trying to digest anything or pee anything. We're trying to run. Megan is having issues. Okay, there. So this is what's happening with the uh, sympathetic nervous system. I'm getting chased by a zombie. My heart rate is going up. Blood pressures are going up. Vasoconstriction, my lungs are expanding. Alveoli are open up. I need more oxygen so I can run. Glucose is being secreted so I can have more energy. So all these things happening, I have medications to control these things. Let's talk about uh, alpha and beta receptors real quick. 
actually it's a long while, but we have alpha one, alpha two, beta one, and beta two. Let me know if anybody else get, gets kicked out. Alpha one, located in the external sphincter of the bladder, causes vasoconstriction. Thus, so every, every time I say, um, I talk about vasoconstriction, always think that I'm increasing blood pressure because it increases peripheral, uh, peripheral resistance. So if my, on my arm, I'm taking my blood pressure, my vessels are constricted, my blood pressures is, are up. This alpha-1 also, also causes pupil dilation and it can cause an increased closure of the internal sphincter. What's happening here? So when alpha-1 is stimulated, we have, that's located in the vascular smooth muscles, we have vasoconstriction, increasing my blood pressure. If you don't remember anything, remember that. It causes vaso uh, um, constriction. Um, so this is what's happening with the alpha one uh, receptor is triggered. Heart rate up, blood pressure up, vasoconstriction, uh, vaso um, dilation of the pupils. So that's alpha one. Now let's talk about what happens with alpha two, which is the opposite of alpha one. So in this case, when alpha-2 is uh, activated, it leads to an inhibition of further release of norepinephrine. So what happens? One thing that happens is in the pancreas, there's a decrease in the secretion of insulin. So my insulin level drops. I don't need to burn as much energy for activity. So alpha-2 is the opposite of alpha-1. Let's talk about beta-1 receptors. These are mainly in the cardiac um, cells, cardiac tissues. They can stimulate increased myocardial activity and increased heart rate. They're also responsible for increased lipolysis or breakdown of fat for energy. I think these are the uh, ketogenic uh, diet people. Let's talk about beta receptors. It's kind of important because when we get to the clinical setting or when you become a nurse, you have beta blockers. And this is the prerequisite for them. There's three of them, beta one, beta two, and beta three. The beta one receptors located in the cardiac muscles increases Let's fast forward to this, increases heart rate, increases contractility, increases AV conductions, meaning increases my heartbeat. Also in the kidneys, what's happening is there's an increase in renin, which causes an increase in blood pressure. So beta one increases my blood pressure and heart rate. Next, beta two, our respiratory therapist friend, they go to school for two years to learn about the beta-2 receptors. When activated in the lungs, it causes bronchodilation. Activation, activation in the vascular smooth muscles also cause vasodilations. Smooth muscles are in the GI tract, uterus, and pancreas. And when activated in the GI tract, it also lowers GI motility. And with beta-2, it is also a medication um, triggering beta-2 receptor also inhibits uh, labor. Okay. Beta-3, there's not much to talk about beta-3 because we don't really use it as much in the clinical setting. Now let's talk about the opposite side of the parasympathetic. I mean, uh, of the sympathetic, the parasympathetic. 
I just talked about increasing your heart rate, increasing your blood pressure, getting your getting some glucose into your system. Now I want to talk about the opposite of that, the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest. Yes, we do have medicine to slow everything down. So this is what happens with the, when the parasympathetic system is turned on. Boop. The opposite of the sympathetic nervous system, heart rate goes down, blood pressure goes down, uh, pupils are constricted, there, there's no goosebumps. Instead of diverting blood from the GI tract into the organs, it is now for pushed into the GI tract, into the organs. I am ready to relax and digest my food and pee and go to sleep with these medications, with this effect. This is what happens when the parasympathetic nervous system is triggered. There's a, a mnemonic for the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. I start salivating secreting, uh, secretions start building up. I start sweating. I start crying. I'm not crying, tearing up because my body is producing excess water. Urination, GI upset because there's so much blood going into my GI system now that it might be getting upset. Bradycardia, my heart rate is slowing down. Bronchoconstriction. I don't have to breathe as much. And poop, bowel movement, abdominal cramps, anorexia. Then again, there's that blood going into my GI tract. And meiosis, pupil constriction. It, so your body is trying to excrete water. And the mnemonic for this is right there, slug bam. You might see the slug part or the bam part in the test. Sounds like a multiple, multiple question. Which is your favorite? Lastly, you have the muscarinic receptors. When I, every time I hear muscarinic, I always think about atropine. They're found in the sweat glands and some vascular smooth muscles. Causes pupil constriction, GI motility, and decreased heart rate. There's some other stuff that is causing, that causes it, but Decreased heart rate and pupil constriction is what we should be focused on. All right, let's talk about the autonomic nervous system and what they do. There's four classifications for the autonomic nervous system. And my job is to help you sort out the terminology, to help you figure out the pharmacology of autonomic nervous system drugs. It's as simple as an on and off switch. But come testing time, this is probably going to be one of the trickier ones because the four things that they do is this. They either turn on the sympathetic nervous system, turn it off, turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, or turn it off. And if I, if, for testing purposes, if I'm going to ask a question, so one of these is the answers. If I am trying to increase my heart rate and blood pressure, of course, I'm gonna turn on the sympathetic nervous system. If I'm trying to slow down my heart rate, maybe I'm tachypnic, there's a storyline that that's attached to it and I need to slow down the heart rate. Maybe I need to turn off the sympathetic nervous system or maybe turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, but we're gonna break it down. The first class is the sympathomimetic drugs, also known as sympathomimetics. For those of you who did not get my slide, I've gotten hundreds of emails from one person saying that they did not get the slide, but I resent it. It was Michelle. So three things happen when you turn on the sympathetic ner nervous system. From the adrenergics, it stimulates adrenaline within our body. So now we're trying to go to the flight, we're in the fight or flight mode, heart rate up, blood pressure up, I'm ready to go. 
Um, for the beta agonist, I also turn on the beta receptors. So my cardiac muscles are stimulated. Alpha agonist, I also turn on the alpha receptors on this one. Vasoconstrictions is happening. So my blood pressure is increasing. Sympathomimetic drugs increases my blood pressure. Why am I talking about all these blood pressure stuff? Increase blood pressure, decrease blood pressure. Because at the end of the day, these medications I'm gonna talk about within the next few minutes, either increase blood pressure or decreases blood pressure. So if I'm asking you a question, here's my storyline, grandma, hypotensive, what kind of medication should we use? Boom, here we go. And this is the answer. Either a sympathomimetic drugs or, um, parasympathomimetic drugs, it's up to you to decide. And I will skip that one. Next, I am turning off the sympathetic nervous system. These are the parasympathomimetics. It mimics the parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest, meaning I'm trying to slow everything down. There are two subcategories of the parasympathetic nervous system, cholinergics and muscarinics. And what these things do is the opposite of the previous one. It decreases my blood pressure. Next, a third class is the sympatholytics. They turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. This is going to be so confusing. Sympathetic, parasympathetic, parasympathetic. I can't even say it, but good luck. So when you turn it on, these three, these three things happen. Adrenergic agonist. This is opposes the sympathetic nervous system. Again, it slows things down. Then there's two classes under this. Alpha blockers and beta blockers. Professor, alpha block. Yes. Uh, isn't that um, adrenergic antagonist? The adrenergic. Did I say it wrong? No, because if it's a sympatholytic, I shouldn't it. it be adrenergic antagonist? Thank you. I have it antagonist on the notes. You guys can transfer that. That's what I meant on the slide. Thank you. I can't fix it now, but if you cross-reference it to my notes, it's antagonist. Sorry, I was half asleep when I was creating this. But yes, you're right, thank you. Um, alpha blockers causes vasodilation instead of vasoconstriction. Beta blockers is the most common sympatholytics. It will slow down heart rate and lower blood pressure. Um, if you are in the clinical setting with me, this I have. This is a drug that I need to information from you before you can safely administer this drug, because um, if you don't know this information, then you cannot give this. I cannot let you give this drug to the patient. And what are those information? Let me see if it's up here. And maybe I'll talk about it later. So this is what happens. I'm slowing, I'm digesting, everything slows down. The fourth and last class. These are drugs that turn off the parasympathetic nervous system. I'm going back up. So it stimulates in a way, increasing my heart rate, blood pressure. And there's two classes, anticholinergic and muscarinic blockers. Anticholinergic, very common. We're gonna be talking about this later on. And an easy way to remember the anticholinergic uh, effect is right here. These drugs dry everything up. I can't see, I can't spit my my um, saliva is drying up, I can't pee, and I can't poop. I am drying. 
So for patients who are um, have a lot of secretions, this is our go-to for these patients. Somebody else is trying to get in. All right, let's talk about some drugs. Some adrenergic antagonists. What are these drugs? How do they work? Different classifications. What are they for? When should we not use them? Side effect and nursing considerations. What you should know. They're called the sympathomimetic drugs because they mimic the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. That's the fight or flight nervous system. It's used for ophthalmic preparations for eye surgery so we can dilate it before the surgery. But for the most part in the hospital, in the clinical setting, we use them for shock. Common contraindications are cardiac disease, tachycardia, high blood pressure. And you guys can see why this would be contraindicated for my patients that has tachycardia and high blood pressure, because this is what these medications do. Two medications that you, you probably will not see these medicines uh, right now, but next semester you will, uh, are the uh, norepinephrine and the epinephrine, noradrenaline or adrenaline. Similar drugs, different chemical structures. They are sympathomimetics. They, both of these drugs increase my, uh, my blood pressures. So what are the indications for these medications I just talked about? Norepinephrine, epinephrine. Critical care setting. When my patient is in shock, I need to give these medications so my patient's blood pressure can go up. I'm not sure if you've seen, uh, I don't know, probably in the, on TV, maybe you've done, a, you've done a, I don't know, you haven't done a critical care rotation yet. But uh, this is the picture I have on the screen. On a very sick patient, this is what's typically running. A couple of these medications running at the same time some sedation, some pain medicine. There's a lot of things going on, but the main part of this are the vasopressors, which are your norepinephrine, dopamine, and epinephrine. And to use these medications, the patient has to be monitored, cardiac monitored continuously. Some of your patients in the med, sur med surge setting, they have the cardiac monitor. They have the cardiac monitor on their chest with wires. Yes, that's cool. There's a, there's a monitor bank in the hospital somewhere. Somebody's monitoring their, their cardiac rhythm. That's nice. But for these, medic, for these patients that's requiring these, um, the norepinephrine and epinephrine, I need continuous cardiac monitoring that I can see right there. ER, ICU, PACU. This is the only place, maybe even IMC. And these are the only places where you can use these medications. Med surge is definitely not a no-no. So if you have a patient in med surge that's uh, maybe they're, they're in shock or they're requiring um, norepinephrine, any of these medications, they would have to be transferred to a, to a, a, a minimum IMC level care, IMC or ICU for closer monitoring. And that's what they mean by closer monitoring. I need a screen to look at. I don't want a monitor tech call, calling me saying my patient is in uh, SVT, sinus rhythms, or sinus tech. I need to see it myself. So I can make adjustments to the medications as needed. These are some of the common medicines. Um, the and the indications for them epinephrine you guys have probably known about epinephrine you've seen it in the movies when somebody's dying i need a dose of epi you've probably seen in a episode of house or if you're an er ems 
ER, you've, you've seen epi, you're familiar with epi. This is what we give patients during cardiac arrest. It's part of the ACLS protocol. Norepinephrine, levofed, it's for treating shock or during cardiac arrest. Not really during cardiac arrest, it's what we call post cardiac arrest care. Um, so after we get the patient back, we are gonna use this medication called norepinephrine or levofed to get our blood pressure up on my patient that just died. There's an old saying, um, levofed, if, I, if we use levofed on a patient, it means levofed, leave them dead. That is, that is as fake news as it gets. That doesn't apply anymore, maybe 50 years ago, but when Florence Nightingale was using levofed, but now with the technologies we have, I may use a levofed on a patient at a low dose, medium dose, and they'll still have a good outcome. Dopamine, shock. This is another one. I'm going to talk about this some more because there's something special about this dopamine that I will more than likely test you on it because it's so specific to this medicine compared to all these drugs on the list. Dobutamine for CHFers. If you become a cardiac nurse, this is your friend, specifically for CHF patients. And ephedrine. These are your, um, your allergy medications. Anaphylactic allergies. And people um, use these, um, have these in their purses or wallets or bag. So what do they do? I've already talked about what they do. So we're going to skip these. Treatment of hypotensive shock. Adverse reactions of these thing, medications, nor epinephrine, epinephrine. Look at that number one, arrhythmias, which is why I need my patient monitored that I can see. Because if I'm waiting for a phone call from the monitor bank to tell me that my patient is in SVT or VTAC, it might be too late by the time I get there. Hypertension, of course, I don't want to use this on hypertensive patients because this is what the medicine is designed to do. So it's kind of basic. Ah, I talked about this earlier. These drugs interact with the antidepressants antidepressants and uh, um, anti-anxiety medications, psych drugs, they react to it. So, but in this case, you were just, you're in cardiac arrest. So I need to give you some epi. I just got you back from cardiac arrest. So uh, now I need to give you some norepinephrine, some dopamine, some levofed. I don't really care if this drug is gonna affect your mental status. I don't really care. Nobody cares right now if this is gonna mess up your antidepressant regimen because you were just dead 10 minutes ago. If I did not do this, we would not be talking about your antidepressants and MAOIs. So it's a risk. Uh, Outweigh benefit, benefit deal? Does the risk outweigh the benefit? Yeah, you're alive. And after we get you back, after you're, you're back to almost normal, then we, the uh, psych physician can uh, get your antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications back to normal. But right now, we don't care about all these interactions. We're trying to save your life. Alpha specific. Uh, oh yeah. So for this one, the alpha agonists, these bind primarily to alpha receptors than beta receptors. I like that. You mean it doesn't have to affect my beta receptors, which are mainly the, the, the lungs? Good. So now I can use this medications for hypotension, um, for 
pupillary dilation without affecting anything else for surgery. Things you need to know for this, um, for this class is the phenylephrine, commonly used drug, midodrin, another commonly used drug, um, and clonidine, another commonly used drug. You probably have administered two out of the three of these medications. I just hope you know you knew what they were prior to administration. If you were in my group, I know you know what they were before you gave them to your patient. So neosinephrine and midodrin. let me go back. Neosinephrine, which is the phenylephrine. These are both medications to increase blood pressure. So here's a pop quiz. What did I write on my note here? I am going to add this to the test if someone can get it right. Hopefully you guys didn't talk to your peers from the other group. So the question is, when, when can I use neosinephrine versus midodrine? What would be an indication for both of these medications? Why would I prefer to use neosinephrine versus midodrine? What's the difference? Type it in the text box. Speak up to me. You can text me. You can call me. Give me an answer. I'm running out of juice. Somebody. This is like the Jeopardy. Do, 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 do. Come on. Morgan, is Neo for intubation? Um, no, it's not. I was trying to tie it into intubation, but no. Adjunct with anesthesia. No. Why would I use this medicine, neosinephrine, to increase my blood fresh pressure versus minodrin, which is also going to increase my blood pressure? They're calling you out, Morgan. You're supposed to know this. Does minodrin last longer? Mm, technically, it does, but that's not the answer. Something to do with the liver. Uh, no, no, not the liver. You guys give up? Renal impairment. What did you just say? Kidney function. Kidney Renal function. Impairment. Who was that? That was Morgan? No. That, that was Morgan. Morgan, no. Here's the answer. That's my screen. Why would I use norepinephrine versus minadrin? Because the difference is this. Minadrin is PO. If I have low blood pressure, I'm intubated in the ICU, I have to use neosinephrine because I am more than likely NPO. But if my blood pressure is low at baseline and I'm going golfing, I'm going to go to work, I'm doing stuff, living my life. I just need a medicine to get my blood pressure up that I can take one, three, four times a day. I'm popping a midodrin. That's what's gonna be prescribed to me. Good call, good guesses. So it's PO only? It's PO only. Okay. If for some reason you cannot take PO, you had abdominal surgery, you're intubated. I don't know, whatever reason it is, you can't swallow, you just had a stroke, then we have to give you something else. Then we have to pick any of the uh, many, many blood pressure medications. Next, adrenergic agonist separated into two catecholamine and non-catecholamine. There are some structural, Morgan failed you. It's okay, Morgan. 
There's some structural differences between the catecholamine and non-catecholamine. This is it. There's three for the catecholamine. They don't really work that well. And they're short acting. For the minimal work that they do, they don't last that long. And they don't get in my CNS that well. So why even use it? Or we can go to the non-catecholamine. It's effective, it lasts long, and it has, it works well. It just penetrates the um, CNS easily. So let's talk about the three types of adrenergic agonists, direct acting, indirect acting, or a combination. Direct acting agonist. This is, you probably know this drug already. You've seen it, you've heard of it. There's only one way to use this drug. Only via injection. This is the epinephrine. This is our ACLS drug, code blue. I need, if you've seen a code blue before, participated in one, you're going to notice that there's a person during a code with a timer. They're timing when this epinephrine is due because they can give this every two minutes or three minutes. I forgot. But there's, we give epinephrine. There's no limit. There's no time frame. We keep giving epi because the epinephrine is, it, it works on the heart. It's supposed to give me a chemical juice to get my heart going, get my heart rate up, blood pressure up. Another use of epinephrine is the, the anaphylactic people, people who have allergies. This is something that they uh, carry with them all the time in their purse in their car, in their wallet, everywhere. If you are uh, one of those patients, uh, people that are highly allergic to a lot of things, this is your lifesaver. And we also use it for cardiac arrest that I already talked about. Food for thought. The EpiPen in the US cost 700 bucks. And in the UK, it only cost $69. I think it was Jeff who said earlier, the better job you have in the US, the better outcome you have, the better teeth you have, or something like that. Oh, I just ruined his uh, quote. There's a joke that Epi can make a rock have a heartbeat. Epi can make a rock have a heartbeat. Ah, yes, I get it, I get it. It took a second, but yes, yes, yes. Compressions, compressions, epi, epi, epi. We will get you back. We will put as much epi into your, uh, to the patient, but at the, if they don't, their heart stops, then that's it. That's the finish line. Let's talk about direct acting agonists. Now, Let's talk about norepinephrine. This is another one of those common drugs. This thing, this drug causes vasoconstriction. And if you remember what happens with the vasoconstriction, it increases my blood pressure. This is the main reason we use this drug to cause vasoconstriction <clears throat> to increase blood pressure. In fact, oh, I think it was with my Summerlin group that I showed you the, the video of this lady, that patient we had, lady with the necrotic fingers and legs. And uh, it was from this, from the vasoconstriction, they're squeezing peripherals, squeezing peripherals until blood flow can't get there anymore, which causes death, cell death. It's one of the side effects of these medications. An indication for norepinephrine is cardiac, I keep saying here cardiac arrest. It's not really for cardiac arrest. The only medications we can give for during cardiac arrest is epinephrine. 
nor epinephrine is something we're going to administer after the cardiac arrest event is over, after we get the patient back. Because after we get the patient back, she, they're going to need medications to get their blood pressure up. And this is it. This is one of them, at least. Next, dopamine. You're going to see this next semester in your critical care rotation. It is one of the commonly used vasopressors in the hospital. In fact, it might even be part of the rapid response protocol. So if somebody's uh, hypotensive in the unit on the fourth, fifth floor, they call rapid response, they're hypotensive, they can start this without a physician's order because it's part of the protocol. So what do you need to know about uh, dopamine? It triggers these receptors, the dopamine receptors, hence the name, also beta-1, alpha-1, and um, typically used in a critical care setting to increase my blood pressure. Okay. There's also something special about this medicine. This medication increases my blood pressure and heart rate. So with this medication, I need to be careful with a heart rate. So if I have a, a patient with the blood pressure of uh, 60 over 20, and Dr. Billy says, Joey, Alex, go ahead and start the dopamine drip on your patient because they're hypotensive. But my, but my baseline heart rate is 140. It's a no-go. I got to tell Dr. Billy, that's not going to work out. My baseline heart rate is already at 130, 140. Once I get this going, we're going to have deeper problems because, because my heart rate is going to go up into the 160, 70. And then we have to deal with that. So pick something else because there's other options. And, and the conversation really happens like that in the critical care setting. Another thing with this uh, medication is um, low dose dopamine increases renal perfusion. Let me repeat that. Low dose dopamine increases renal perfusion. If I have a patient going, going, to, uh, going through renal failure, but they're not a dialysis patient yet, we're gonna hit them up with a low, low dose dopamine to get vaso uh, more blood flow, hopefully more blood flow into their renal arteries to get more blood flow there and hopefully kickstart the, the kidneys. And once the kidneys kickstart, patient pees again and they're okay. Because if that doesn't happen, the next step will be dialysis. And we don't really want that for our patient unless they have to. It sucks to be a dialysis patient. Next, alpha-1 and alpha-2. Three medications to know here. Oxymetrazoline, phenylephrine, and clonidine. Phenylephrine. These are typically in the, um, what do you call those? The, the sinus medicine, the allergy, me not the allergy medicine, uh, I think that you buy over the counter. Uh, nasal decongestants that you buy, Sudafed, yes, thank you, that you buy over the counter. It opens it up, you can breathe again. It vasodilates. That is in a very low, minute dose in a hospital setting. We're not dealing with the minute dose. We, when we use phenylephrine, we go the big daddy dose. So with the big daddy dose, Oh, let me talk about the oxymetrazoline, also dilates the pupils. Yeah, that's not um, for eye redness. So let me go back to phenylephrine. So with the big dose of phenylephrine, this is what happens. Increase my blood pressure. And then for the alpha-2 clonidine, I've noticed based on my experience 
that typically dialysis patients are on clonidine. I think the uh, nephrologist likes this for blood pressure control because they're probably on, on low pressure, Norvas, all these calcium channel blockers already and nothing is working. So I think this is the main reason our nephrologist uses clonidine for uh, blood pressure. Next, beta receptors, beta one and beta two. Beta one is my heart, dobutamine. When I say do dobutamine, all you need to remember is um, congestive heart failure patient, not heart failure patient. Because what dopamine does is increases cardiac rate and output. In a nutshell, it causes your heart to squeeze better. Boom, boom, boom. And with our CHF patients, their heart is weak. They probably have an EF of 15, 10. That means only 10% of the blood is squeezing out of the heart every time it beeps. That sucks. They're in bed. They can't move. They can't breathe. So this is the medicine they, we give them. Unfortunately for them, there is no pill for this. This is a band aid that we will give them to get their heart to squeeze better, faster, and maybe while they're waiting for heart surgery, maybe they're, while they're waiting for a valve replacement. So this is not a cure-all, fix-all drug for these people. Next is the uh, beta-2 lungs. Whoa. Beta-2 is lungs. We have um, our short-acting beta-2 agonist, albuterol. If any of you guys are asthmatic, you know about albuterol. Terbutaline. And you also have salmeterol and formeterol, which are the long actings. So if I'm an asthmatic, I'm having an as asthma attack, and you get, try to give me an, a salmeterol, I will throw this thing back at you because it's not going to do anything to me. And for meterol, I need albuterol. I need a quick acting, short acting breathing medicine for my asthma attack. What happened? Quick. There. Beta 3, Mirabiron. I don't really have, haven't seen this. Um, but it is for the relief of symptoms of overreactive bladder. Indications for beta-specific adrenergic agonists. Isoprel. And who is asking this question? Morgan, why do you keep asking these questions? I thought you know all about these drugs. That's why they called on you. But it does. That's why we don't use it as much. That's why we use albuterol. And if the albuterol, albuterol still causes increased heart rate. But, and if it does, there's other medicines like Zopinex to, um, for that. Good question. Even though you're supposed to know that already. I guess I got to switch back to a regular coffee since my special coffee's done. Um, indications for beta specific, isoprel, another breathing medication, also used for um, preterm labor. But this medication used to be part of the, um, the ACLS protocol. But there's so many medications out there now with lesser side effects. So um, we don't use this as much anymore. You will rarely or probably never ever see isoprel being used as a breathing treatment. Because if I'm short of breath, I'm having an asthma attack, you give me this isoprel and look at the adverse reactions on this. Restlessness, anxiety, fear, tachycardia, um, WTF. Why are you giving me something that's gonna cause all this and I, I can't breathe already? 
I'm having, um, I'm already having anxiety because I can't breathe and you're giving me something that will cause all this. So thanks, but no thanks, I'll pass. Um, drug card for isoproteranol, you can skip this. We're... Indirect acting agonist. So with these drugs, they don't directly interact with the postsynaptic receptors, but they enhance the effect of epinephrine or norepinephrine by the inhibition of their, of their degradation. The best example of this indirect acting agonist is cocaine and uh, I think this is supposed to be amphetamine. I didn't know what amphetamine looks like, so I couldn't really Google picture. I think it's a pill. I didn't know if it was math. I should have consulted some of you guys. But um, so that's why these drugs are, um, are highly addictive because it makes, uh, it takes away some of these uh, receptor side. It blocks them from working. Next are the mixed action agonists. Ephedrine, same, back to the sinus medication because it causes vasoconstriction. You can breathe again. Oops. It also causes uh, um, bronchodilation, but we don't like these medic medications anymore unless it's the pseudoephedrine for, for sinus because it's in such a low dose. Even if, even if it is, I think you need, somebody told me earlier, you, need a, you don't need a prescription to buy it. You just need an ID or something and they log your name down. Dopamine, what you need to know about dopamine is it helps with my blood pressure, but tachycardia is a big side effect for this. I don't know if it, it's either a side effect or desired effect. If I have a patient that has a blood pressure of 60 over 40, I need to get their blood pressure up and also a heart rate of 29, hey, I want to get heart rate and blood pressure up. Dopamine is my guy. Let's use you, dopamine. If I try to use something else, norepinephrine, phenylephrine, it's going to increase my blood pressure, but my heart rate is going to remain at 29. Phenylephrine, look at this, IV, immediate. As soon as I hook up my patient to this, it works right away. That's why these patients are monitored. Standard of care in the ICU is vitals, blood pressure every 15 minutes. So I can make adjustments to these medications on the spot. If I have a patient with on this, on phenylephrine and the blood pressure went up to 200 over 100, ah, oh, that's okay. I'm not gonna panic. I'm simply going to titrate the medication. If I overshot my titration and now I'm at 60 over 10, oh shit, let me turn it up a little bit. So it's, it's a balancing game. And this is what you're going to do. It's, it's your job to do that. Of course, you're going to be trained on it. So don't panic. It happens. Something happens. Adrenergic agonists. Sympatholytics, what are these medications? How they work? What do we use it for? When do we not use it? And what do you need to know about these medications? Morgan? They're mainly cardiac drugs. Yeah, skip this part. So this is how an adrenergic agonist, this is how I see it. I'm a coffee drinker. So this is how I'm gonna analyze it. The cup, the cup is the receptor site and the coffee is your adrenergic agonist. So when I pour coffee into the cup, my, 
I have vasoconstriction, heart rate goes up, blood pressure, pressure goes up, adrenaline goes up. But when I use, when I change this into an adrenergic antagonist, which is the opposite, in this case, I put Benadryl up there. Now I'm sucking on Benadryl instead coffee. Of course, my heart rate is going to go down. Blood pressure is going to go down. I'm going to fall asleep. I'm going to slow down. And these are divided into the alpha and beta, again, like the others. Ooh, alpha blockers. What happens when alpha receptors are blocked? There's a vasodilation and my blood pressure decreases. Vasodilation, blood pressure decreases. Vasoconstriction, blood pressure increases. So in this case, vaso blood pressure decreases. Two medications that are alpha blockers are, and you need to know these, both of these medications, pentolamine and tamlucosin. Two different drugs, same classifications, two different uses, and this is how they work. The phentolamine, and yeah, we can skip this part. Extravasation. So when I'm infusing an IV fluid in my medication, the picture on the screen is the catheter tip of the IV inside the vein. Normal saline is infusing, all is well. But sometimes my IV gets infiltrated. What does that mean? That means the catheter tip is not inside the vein anymore. Okay, nothing special. It's standard, happens all the time. We simply replace, you take out the old IV, replace it with a new IV and life moves on. Great. So if the if the if normal saline was infusing on this patient, the normal saline will simply go to the tissues, and eventually the tissues it, it will get reabsorbed in the tissues, and that's it. You best thing for you guys to do is give the patient a warm compress to get the swelling down, and it should be gone in a couple of hours, a day at the most. Okay, but what happens? If I am infusing um, a vasopressor, norepinephrine, dopamine, phenylephrine, vaso, uh, vasoactive agents, bad, bad, bad. This is what happens when some of these vasoactive active agents gets, um, the IV gets infiltrated. Oh, oh. This is a, it's cell death because the surrounding tissues get vasoconstricted. So there's no blood flow that's happening there. And it's starting to die quickly. This is a, an emergency. If this is your patient, I need rapid response. I need the intensivist at the bedside. I need the pharmacist. I need somebody. We're about to lose this patient's limb, arm, arm, wherever this IV is. This is the main reason why we, ha why we have, um, when we have patients on uh, vasopressors, that they need a, uh, a um, central line, pick line, central line, whatever else, as long as it's not a peripheral, because this can happen. So now what? Here we go. We have this medical emergency. We're about to lose this patient's arm, hand. Oh, here's another one extravasation from norepi and dopamine. So what do we do? I need phentolamine. Phentolamine is my, the vasodilator I'm gonna use. I'm, I'm gonna inject the phentolamine like a Botox shot on this patient's arm. I'm trying to get as much phentolamine medication under this patient's arm so I can dilate the, the peripherals, the tissues, so I can get blood flow around them. 
And on the right side of the picture here, I'll put some red marks. I will inject the fentolamine around these sides. And also on, I forgot to put on top of it, all over this thing so I can get blood flow into this patient and hopefully, hopefully not have to amputate this patient's arm because they, this is not good for the patient. They're gonna, on the patient on the left, they're gonna have to amputate this arm, this hand above the wrist and under the elbow on the other side, on the other patient. And this is just from um, infiltration of a vasoactive drug. So there's that. You can read that. It's highlighted. Maybe it's highlighted for a reason. It's there. Look at it. We've talked about it already. Mentolamine. It works rapidly. I need to get this drug inside my patient's infiltrated arm, ASAP. So when you have, if this is happening to your patient or um, a lot of people are involved, pharmacy will be running from the pharmacy department to the unit to hand deliver this medicine to you so you can give it to the patient ASAP. Time is ticking. The more, the longer we wait, the longer the chances of us saving this patient's arm goes whoosh by a lot. Next is alpha blockers. No, still alpha blockers. Oh, the other alpha blockers I'm going to talk about is, man, we talked about this. Remember, it causes vasodilation, but one part that it also causes vasodilation is in the bladder, neck, and prostate glands. So why am I talking about this? Because this is a medicine we give patients that has BPH to open up, where's my arrows, to open up their prostate glands so they can pee so they can pee normally, they can pee better. If not, it's gonna be an issue because now we're talking about retaining urine, retaining fluids, fluid overload, not to mention that it's painful. So what are we gonna do to these patients? We're gonna give them this medicine called, yeah, OSIN, alpha-1 blockers are all under the OSIN, but, right here at the bottom, tamlucosin. Every time you hear tamlucosin, I could be half asleep. If I hear tamlucosin, BPH, I don't even think about it. Tamlucosin, Flomax, BPH. For those of you who have um, put in Foley's before, if a patient has a BPH, remember you have to use this special Foley tip that has, that's kind of curved so you can get past through that, uh, that um that enlarged prostate so bph equals tamlucosin flomax doxycycline we don't really use this as much in, especially for blood pressure control so no it's the tamlucosin is the um drug of choice for the bph Side effects of beta blockers, it's fairly, it's simple. It's, uh, they're gonna get dizzy, they may get dizzy. So from your end, you will need, you need to educate your patient. Be careful when you're getting up. Watch, watch your step, get up slowly. And you might also cause, um, um, you might also experience some headaches and nasal congestions, and these are normal. Alpha-2 selective, selective blockers. Eh, we'll skip that because we don't do much with the alpha-2 blockers. It's, um, there is, it's for research use. We're not researching anything. Beta blockers. This is my favorite medicine because you know, some of you know. Like the alpha blockers, they can be either selective or non-selective. 
and they can be grouped into three generations. First, second, third, but when we're in the clinical setting, a beta blocker is a beta blocker because remember what I keep telling you guys, we need to talk to our patient, patients at the second grade level. But for uh, pharmacology purposes, I need to know if you know the first generation, second generation, or third generation beta blockers. This is how they work. Beta one affects mainly the heart and beta two affects mainly the lungs. And that's our RT friends, um, life. Indications for beta blockers include hypertension, heart failure, heart attack, angina, cardiac arrhythmias, glaucoma, Migraine prophylaxis. I haven't seen it as a migraine prophylaxis. So let's talk about the first generation beta blocker. These are non-selective, meaning they block beta one and beta two receptors. Okay. Decrease heart rate, lower blood pressure. The propanolol can also be used for migraine and the timolol down here, it can be used to dilate the pupils, mainly for um, surgery. And it's also used for, um, you're gonna have some patients um, when you get to your clinical setting, they might have eye drops that you will drop it yourself. And it's typically timolol for their glaucoma. What is this? Nope. Next, adverse reactions of this, uh, beta, this beta blocker, bradycardia, heart block, hypotension, can cause bronchospasm. There's an asterisk there, an asterisk there. I don't know why. But sometimes the bradycardia is my desired effect as opposed to adverse reaction. So some providers will specifically pick this medicine for that adverse reaction, especially if my heart rate is 150 and my blood pressure is high. This is my drug, this is for me. It also causes bronchospasm. If I'm asthmatic, maybe this is not for me. Uh, decreases libido, mm, that's it. So these are the drugs. There's a lot of drugs here. You don't have to remember any of these. Maybe from this page, the timolol. Uh, the timolol, because it's used for the glaucoma. Next. You guys know this already, beta blockers, olols. Just a reminder. So contraindications for the first generation beta blockers are it causes bronchospasm. I am not going to give this beta first generation beta blocker to a COPD patient. You know what else? To uh, my asthmatic patients. There's no way I'm going to give this medication to somebody who cannot breathe to begin with. This thing causes bronchospasm. Let's imagine if I give this to my COPD patient and my asthmatic patient. So I fix their blood pressure issue, but now I have to deal with a breathing issue. Uh, nope, I'll pass, I'll use something else. Now let's talk about the second generation beta blockers. I like this. Because this is specific to the cardiac. Mm. It has minimal effect on the lungs. So what does that mean? That means I can use this on my COPD patient. I can use this on my asthmatic patient. Mm, that sounds like a test question. What medicine should I use for my patient who can't breathe? Who's asthmatic? Who's COPD? I don't know if that's a test question. It sounds like an NCLEX question. It's or just a 
clinical question. So what are these medications? Out of these medications on the list, atenolol, esmolol, well, three stars on the metoprolol. I had a conversation with, I don't know, a couple of you, so a couple of um, you guys on metoprolol. This is, oh there, I knew I put it in there. This is one of the commonly given drugs in the hospital. And what did I say here? You better know this in clinicals. If you don't know that metoprolol decreases heart rate and blood pressure, I cannot let you administer this in the clinical setting. I will let you call a friend. I will, you can Google it. You can, what is that? Do refer to nursing central, but I need you to know that this medication is a special blood pressure medicine because it causes, it lowers blood pressure and heart rate at the same time. This was a student last semester, I believe. She was telling me that she is gonna give a metoprolol to the patient. And I'm just sitting there, somebody took a picture. I'm not moving until you tell me what the patient's heart rate and blood pressure is. It's not a go until you know this information. What did I say here? You better know this in clinicals, especially in 484. What is this? Oh, who is this? I took a picture of this last week with, I forgot who. So this is a, if you work in the Valley, if you're doing your clinicals at a, any of the Valley Health System, Summerlin, Valley Hospital, Desert Springs, Centennial and all the others. This is what the MAR looks like. If you look on the screen, the metoprolol has a hard stop. It says hold for heart rate of 55. If you work at any of these hospitals, please make sure your mouse, you hover over the medicine before you administer, before you, when you're looking it up, because it will give you more information. Because here it says hold for heart rate or less than 55. It might say, and also hold for if, hold if SBP is less than, I don't know, 110 or 90, whatever other information it will be here. Don't forget that part. And you probably have learned from previous pharmacology that, oh, actually in 304, to hold this medicine, this beta blocker, if the heart rate is less than, than 60, or if the SBP is less than 90. That is a good generic answer, but as you can see on the screen, it is patient driven. It is patient specific because if my heart, my baseline heart rate is say 50, so I am still safe to take this medicine if my heart rate is 52. And that's why pay attention to your orders. Third generation beta blockers. Carvedilol. Carvedilol or, or Coreg. Most patients know this medications under Coreg. Where are you? There. It causes vasodilation, heart rate down, blood pressure down. Um, that's the non-selective. And on the selective, Nebivalol, betaxolol for uh, pupillary dilation. So what do you need to know about um, these beta blockers? Heart rate. I need to know heart rate and blood pressure before you administer these medications. Um, if they have any breathing problems, because that's going to classify, then you have to look deeper. Oh shoot, is this a one, two or three beta blocker I'm giving my patient? And that's it for the most part. Take home message for our beta blockers that I've said many times, I've drilled this if you're in the clinical setting with me, before you can administer a beta blocker, I need heart rate and blood pressure and it's not negotiable. You cannot safely administer this medication without knowing the heart rate and blood pressure. 
if the if these um, heart rate and blood pressure was taken an hour ago, an hour and a half ago, sure, I'll take it. But if it was taken at midnight last night, eight or four o'clock this morning, we need more. We need the current vitals for that. Check heart rate and BP. And if it is under that, under the, the hold parameters, then it's okay. Hold it, notify the provider. Dr. Jones, um, just FYI, we held the low presser for your patient because their heart rate is 29. Okay, that's it. Alpha and beta adrenergic agents. These are the same, same, same. What am I looking for here? There's nothing specific. Nope, I'm gonna skip all this. A duplicate. Actually, I need to, right here, amiodarone. It says here, serious emergencies and only use an, as an antiarrhythmic. Mm, not really. This is something we're going to use as an antiarrhythmic. What's a serious emergency? In this case, they're talking about VTAC. Of course, that's a serious emergency. I have to shock the patient. We're in the cold blue. Next. Coreg, we talked about that already. Most of our um, CHF patients are on air. And libetalol, if you notice, at least for the um, Valley Health System people, you have your scheduled medicine in the blue. Uh, green is the PRN listing. If you look at your PRN listing, you will have PRN for, for fever, PRN for pain and PRN for, usually PRN for blood pressure. Typically, labetalol and hydralazine are uh, two of the medicines we give for PRN, and they're usually IVs. So pop quiz, amiodarone, it is used as an antiarrhythmic. What does it do? It slows down my heart rate. It slows down my heart rhythm. So if I have a patient who's on a, um, whose heart rate is, let's say 180, that's bad. That's SVT. They cannot sustain that. So the physician will order the amiodarone. This is an IV. It can be pill, but typically we start this as an IV infusion. And with the IV infusion, it's usually six hours at a at a big dose, at a one milligram dose, and then 16 hours at the half a dose, and then we change them over to the pill, to the PO. So what if you're paying, here's a pop quiz. What if you have a patient that has a heart rate of 180, the physician started them on amiodarone. You did the six hour, one milligram dose, it's working fine. And you still have about 10 hours left to go for this infusion. And now this drug is working so well in your patient so that their heart rate went from 180 to 52. That's good. So what would you do? What would Morgan do in this case? My heart rate went down to 52 from 180 using the amiodarone. What can I do for this patient? Give me some. Why is my text message like this? What can I do? Call the doc, titrate it down. Mm, I see, I like where you're going with this. Anybody else? You're, you're kind of there. Call the doc, titrate it down. Cause I'm already at the lower dose end of it. I'm gonna throw you a bone. It's uh, even though I'm not done with the infusion yet, I'm stopping it. Stop. Yes, I was just two steps ahead of you. But yes, you're right. I'm stopping it. It doesn't matter if you're done with the infusion. You just started. If my heart rate is 52, that's going to drop down to the 20s, to the 10s if I keep going with this. And then you have bigger problems. And we don't like bigger problems.
Pop quiz. This is easy. What medication would you give for this infiltrate of dopamine? Note, if you don't do any action, this patient can lose this arm. That's bad. In probably a day or two, that black, this area in the middle, that's going to turn black. And once it turns black, it's dead. You, there's no way of rescuing it once it turns black. Phentolamine, correct. Oh, if you're in my clinical group, you know about how to calculate pack your history. If not, maybe we need to chit chat. But a 64 year old patient with a 49 pack year history has been diagnosed with COPD. Of course, that's a lot of cigarettes. Of course, you're going to be COPD. What classification of adrenergic blocking antagonist would be the safest for this client to treat angina? B, 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 B. I don't think. No, I think it's fourth generation. First generation, non-selective. Second generation, selective, minimal to the lungs. Third generation to the mix. So that's correct. You guys know what fourth generation is? I don't know either. I just made that up. Here's my storyline. I need a short acting beta two agonist for an asthmatic patient in respiratory distress. Dr. Kravorkin, half asleep with a hangover, turns to you and says, hey, give me some recommendation. I'm, I'm not up to this. What would you tell him? Are you sure it's D? I kind of want to intubate this patient and get it over with. If I can intubate this patient, I can control everything about their breathing from the pressure to the secretion management. It's just so much easier if I intubate this patient. But yes, albuterol is my go-to for respiratory distress. Did we talk about status asthmaticus? No, I think that might be a different one. What drug is used for the cardiac rhythm below? I know you have not talked about this yet. You haven't covered, oh, such a gorgeous is on it, even though we haven't talked about this yet. I know, Sadie, no, we, we didn't talk about this. But from your end, the patient is in tachycardia. VTAC, to be more specific, this is a dangerous, um, this is a lethal um, cardiac rhythm. They're about to die if they're not dead already. So we probably shocked this patient. Uh, we've done a lot of stuff, but to get this under control, yes, we are gonna have to use um, amiodarone for this, for this patient. I wish I did your, I uh, taught your, um, your, uh, your med surge class. This is, would be so cool. There's so much storylines that goes with this. Cholinergic agonist. What is it? How does it work? Why do we use them? This is why. Three medications you need to remember are bethanicol, pyrostigmine, and donezepil. Actually, there was another one. There's a fourth one there. Tensilon. Tesla, well, we'll get to that. It's under pyrostigmine. Eh. What is it? It's often called a parasympathomimetic drug. It slows everything down. Remember the slug band? They're not limited to a specific site like the alpha or beta specific drugs. So there's two types direct acting 
and indirect acting. One drug that I told you that you need to know about is the bethanicol. What is it for? What do we use it for? Who uses these medications? There's the action, you can read it, but we use it for patients with an overreactive bladder. It increases the tone of the detrusor mass muscle in the bladder and relaxes the, bl the bladder, actually not the over underreactive bladder. So it helps with urinary retention. It is given either sub-Q or PO. That's what you need to know about this drug. Urinary retention. This is my go-to drug. Contraindications for this is eh, nothing generic stuff. Um, eh. What is this? I need to skip to this one. Next is the pyrostigmine. Pyrostigmine medications. You need to know this drug. This is my myasthenia grab gravis medications. Uh, Mestinon, Reginol, whatever brand it is, but this is my myasthenia gravis drug. I think I told this story to the uh, other group earlier when I was doing research on this. I found out that Winnie the Pooh, Christopher Robinson is a real person and this is him. And he is, he is one of the, a famous person who had a myasthenia, who had myasthenia gravis, kind of cool. He died at 75 years old. And also, okay, back to my mestinon, pyrostigmine. It's also used to stimulate the bladder and GI tract after surgery. Because if you've ever had surgery before, the anesthesia shuts down your body. And this kind of restarts the GI tract, which is the main reason you are still NPO. Aside from anesthesia or being intubated, you're still NPO after surgery because your bowels are not moving yet. That's why we put our stethoscope on their bowels, on their belly. Next is the myasthenia gravis. A quick review of the myasthenia gravis from your med surge class is characterized by a weakness and rapid fatigue of any of the muscles under your voluntary control. Myasthenia gravis from the mind to the ground. It looks like my patient is having a stroke, but they're not. It's a, it's a um, neuromuscular disease that caused by antibodies and there's nothing we can do about it. The only thing we can do is to diagnose it. And it's hard to diagnose these things because it's, I don't know if my patient is having a stroke or my gravis, or maybe they're drunk, maybe they're drug overdose. I don't know. There's so much information to, uh, to look into, but luckily for you, for the patient, we have this thing. Uh, pyrostigmine, I've talked about that already, is the medication used for myasthenia gravis. In fact, it's the medication used to control the symptoms of myasthenia gravis. It is not the medicine to treat this disease. There's no treatment. It's simply uh, disease management, symptom management. Next. Boom. Next is the Tensilon, Androphonium. I've never, I don't even know how to pronounce Androphonium because I don't know it as Androphonium. Nobody knows it as Androphonium. It's called the Tensilon. It's a diagnostic agent for myasthenia gravis. So if you look at my picture here, to the left is my patient, I should have covered this. To my left is a patient with myasthenia gravis. It looks like they're having a stroke. Half of their face is, is drooping. If this patient comes into my ER, I would say, that's a stroke. 
let's get a CAT scan, let's get, let's get stuff together. We're dealing with a stroke, code white. But after further testing, we're gonna find out, we're gonna know that, oh, that's not a stroke, then what? So on that note, we're gonna do a, what we call a Tensilon test. So what this thing does is we will give this patient a, the Tensilon, I don't know the dosage, it's not important, but we're gonna give this patient a Tensilon. And when it does start working, usually within the next 10 minutes or so, the patient is gonna go right here in the after. They're gonna smile again. Everything is gonna be normal again. That confirms that the patient has myasthenia gravis. Unfortunately, the patient, this thing will expire in 10 minutes. So within 10 minutes, they're gonna go back to their before. It just tells us that we are dealing with a myasthenia gravis, we can prescribe the pyrostigmine, refer the patient to rehab, and that's it, since there's no treatment for this. So if the patient has a positive Tensilon test, that means they have myasthenia gravis. Probably see that again, somewhere, somehow, in a couple of weeks. Pyrostigmine, talked about this already. It is used for the treatment of myasthenia gravis. Oh, not treatment, treatment for the symptoms. There's no treatment. Now let's talk about Alzheimer's disease. It is one of the most common type of dementia. This is a clip from one of my favorite movies, The Notebook. I think I told the uh, other group, this is my favorite movie now, even though I was forced to watch it. But then I liked it. And yeah, it's my favorite movie now. Even though it's a chick flick, it's still good. It's a progressive disorder involving the neural degeneration of the cortex. It leads to a loss of memory and ability to carry on activities of daily living. We don't know what causes it yet. A few famous people who, uh, who, um, who have Alzheimer's, one of my favorite singers, Tony Bennett, go ahead, punk, make my day guy. Darth Vader, President Reagan, for the boxing fan, Sugar Ray Robinson, for Rocky, it's Mickey. So one thing that these patients, these people took to manage their disease is a drug called Dunazepil or Arisat. It enhances their cholinergic effect and helps them lead a somewhat improved cognitive in function. Just like in the notebook movie, remember the lady kept, she keeps coming back every now and then, every now and then. It doesn't cure the disease, the disease. It doesn't stop it, but it kind of brings them a little bit of light every now and then. Side effect of this medications include diarrhea, urination, myosis, or muscle weakness, bronchorrhea, excessive production of a uh, sputum or uh, yeah, sputum or spit, bradycardia, emesis, excessive tearing, and uh, salivation or sweating, or dumbbells. This may also be a select all that apply, side effects of cholinergic agonists, dumbbells. Easy way to remember it. Donazepil talked about this already. It is used, this is the drug card for it, to, for symptom management for um, Alzheimer's disease. Nerve gases, eh, I don't really wanna talk about nerve gases. If I do, I just wanna highlight that atropine is our agent for it to reverse the nerve gas. 
Pop quiz. Aricep or donazepil is the best agent to reverse Alzheimer's disease. Jared, I haven't even done, I wasn't even done reading the question yet. I think you, you're wrong. I'm, see, you have to look at my wording. It's the best reversing agent. It's the best. That's a trick word I throw up there. You guys are easy, easily fall for the, the trick words. All right, maybe not this time. Anticholinergic drugs. With Alzheimer's, we wanted them to have more ACH. Now we want them to have less. They're used to block the effects of acetylcholine. So because we want to decrease their GI activity and secretions for ulcer management. Maybe they're going for GI surgery and we want all these things to slow down. So what happens when you block the parasympathetic nervous system? That means I am no, I don't want the parasympathetic nervous system. This, which means the opposite is going to happen, right? My heart rate is going to go up. Blood pressure is going to go up. Back to run and gun or fight or flight. BP's up. I'm ready to go. So one anticholinergic medicine that's used frequently is the atropine. It has um, different effects, mainly in the eyes, GI tract, heart, and salivary sweat, lacrimal, lacrimal glands. And let's break it down. In the eyes, this is what happens. It causes dilation of the pupil. So uh, eye surgeons use this to dilate the pupil so they can do their surgery. And when they do that, of course, you're going to lose inability to focus. And I'm not sure, I think I asked this on a previous class. I'm not sure if this is what they use to dilate your pupil so they can do your eye exam. If anybody works at, the, at an eye clinic, let me know. And for the GI tract, it decreases GI motility that causes um, prolonged gastric emptying. But why do we want to do that? Don't we, don't we want to poop every day? We want to be regular, right? Well, maybe I'm having some GI issues. Maybe I'm having some GI bleeding. And I don't want my stomach, my, my belly, my GI tract to, to work or work in overtime. And I need it to slow down for now. Next, the heart. This is the most important part of atropine. This is what we use atropine the most. Actually, yeah, the most. The next is the second. It blocks the SA node and AV node receptors. It's in the crash cart. It used to be part of the ACLS protocol, but they took it out. So now we mainly use it for the management of bradycardia. So if I have a patient that's bradycardic, this is my go-to. Ask if the crash cart is there, ask where I need atropine and somebody's gonna hand it to me because it's right there in a the crash cart. Keep in mind, when I give atropine to a patient, this is a Band-Aid. I am going to increase my patient's uh, heart rate for minutes, maybe a couple of hours, just enough for me, for the team to figure out how to fix the underlying cause of my heart rate of 38, 28, whatever, however low it is. You still have to fix it. This is not the drug for it. Next salivary sweat and lacrimal glands. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm out in town, I'm having a good time. Sometimes I drink too much and then I start 
producing a lot of a lot of spit, a lot of saliva, and I start sweating, uh, and my eye starts watering. I don't know why, but if I have atropine, if I have atropine, small doses, by the way, it's probably a patch behind the ear. This is used to, um, to dry the mouth, to dry the skin. So I'm not producing as much um, secretions. Very helpful if you have a patient on a ventilator that's producing a lot of secretions. And I'm having a hard time trying to exhibit my patient because they're producing a lot of secretions. So I can't wean them. I keep failing because of the secretions. Let me give you a nick an atropine patch in the, behind your ear to control your secretions so I can maybe work with you in taking you off this ventilator. Eh. Dicyclamine, it relaxes the GI tract. Same storyline with my, with my GI bleed patient, with my GI surgery patient, with my, uh, I don't know what other indications I would need to slow my GI tract, but this is the medications we use for it. Trees hyperactive bowel or irritable bowel. Contraindications for this, glaucoma, peptic ulcer disease, BPH and bladder obstruction. With this medications, dicyclamine, it, caution, not contraindicated, but be careful using it on breastfeeding patients. And it also causes uh, spasticity. Drain damage, you can take that off the list. Um, so here we go again with the drug to drug interaction, MAOIs and the antidepressants and antipsychotics. This is where the benefits outweigh the risk. If you're a uh, psych patient, we, we kind of have to, I'm sorry, we have to stop you from taking your antidepressants right now, your antipsychotics, because we're trying to deal with your GI issues, with whatever issues you have. We can address all that later on when, when you're okay. This might be a good time to do the holistic um, antipsychotics or, or antidepressive um, regimen or treatments, but we just cannot combine them at this time. So with these medications, we need a good history. This is generic because it's, it applies on all the medications we are, uh, we're gonna administer. Here's my drug card for the atropine. There's only two things you need to remember for this drug. There's a lot, but I'm only asking you for two things. To decrease secretions before surgery. Actually, I shouldn't, shouldn't have underlined before surgery. I just wanted to decrease secretions for whatever reason it might be. And the most important part is relief of bradycardia. This is our go-to for bradycardia, especially symptomatic bradycardia. It is an emergence drug. How emergent is this drug? It's right here, IV. It works right away, it's immediate. As soon as I push this medicine, if you get a chance to do this, to push this drug, please, I know your heart rate is probably gonna be up. It's probably in an emergency situation. You're probably not gonna remember this, but if you get a chance to do this, when you're pushing, look up on the monitor. You're gonna see it right away. If their heart rate is 20, beep, Beep, beep. It's, you're going to see it instantly. Beep, 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 beep. It's cool to see. So I'll remind you if I'm there to look at the monitor. Questions? And um, 
for some of you guys who have I haven't talked to, look at the notes of my of my slides because um, sometimes when I talk, it records it there, and I also have notes there. A lot of the information I'm talking about, most if not all of my testing questions come from there. If you don't know where the notes are, it's at the, if you have the slides pulled up, it's at the bottom, depending on what view you have. Questions, questions? If not, I will see some of you on Thursday and Friday. And uh, questions for the, um, and if I haven't, who is that? For your clinical paperwork feedback, by the way, PS, if you're in my clinical group, I will talk to you about it. Uh, I think I would rather we discuss it in person because instead of me clicking, typing, clicking, typing. So uh, if I haven't put anything for your paperwork, that's why, because we're just gonna talk about it. It's just easier that way. Anything else? Anything else, Morgan? Michelle, just want to make sure Michelle got the slides. I guess I have to send it separately now. All right, it's better. Lit. I guess it wasn't just Michelle. I'm just messing with you, Michelle. And now you can put your uniform back on, gorgeous. What room are you guys in? I think you're on the left side. I think I know. That's it. Goodbye. Professor, you would know if you were here. I know. I can, I can I'm right there. And maybe I should. Where is that? Maybe I can just, maybe I'll do that next time. I can just sit up front, get my computers all set up, I might even use the big screen. Let's see. So is there a room there? Yeah, they be. said we could use it because they, there's not any other classes being held in here today. That's the room on the left side, right? When you're walking down the hall on the left side? Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's like between the, huh? Yeah, classroom three, I think. Yeah, I don't know where that is. Maybe we'll do that next time. But then I can't have my special coffee in that room. Sure you can. Just put it in a different different mug. <laughs> That's all good. All right. I'll see you guys Friday then. Professor Texan, can I ask you a question about the anticholinergic drugs and coming off of antipsychotics? If we have to wean patients or traditionally if we wean patients off of them, would it just be because we're using this, like that it wouldn't matter to wean them off or we would just stop them immediately with oh, this drug? See, there is no, who's asking, where are you? Who are you? Where are you? It's Lauren. Oh, no, right we don't wean. We would like to wean you, but we can't because weaning you would, would take some time. We are in an emergent situation right now. Your heart rate is 29. I don't have right. hours to wean you. I don't have days to wean you. What's the proper way of weaning off this, uh, these medication? From weeks, right? Days to yeah, weeks. Yeah, it can take. Yeah, it can take weeks or month, a month oh. even. So in this situation, we just deal with, we just stop the current dosing because they can stay in your system for up to six months, correct? So we just deal with the side effects. Right. Okay. So, so then that's something to be aware of in that situation too? Yes. Uh, that's why um, there's, um, there's uh, uh, delirium is uh, one side effect that we're looking for when we have somebody in the uh, in a ICU or intubated, because this is one of the side effects when we take somebody off of these, maybe they have, there's, they're, they're on a lot of these medications. And let's imagine cold turkey on five different drugs, pop. 
And, um, and sometimes too, we have a hard time weaning patients uh, when we intubate them and, uh, and then we, their heart stops, we get them back. We have a hard time weaning them because here we are trying to wake them up and here's my brain. I'm used to being on 10, five anti-anxiety, SSRI, uh, whatever medications I'm on. And then now it's not there anymore. And here you are, you're waking me up. I'm confused, I'm freaking out. And we have a hard time with those patients. So in those cases, we start, we add them. We start adding them, even though they're still on a ventilator, even though they're not quite there yet, but it will help us. It will help us, it will help the patient get their mental status back. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. I was just curious when, like on the slide, when it said that you had to stop that, that, you know, we have to wean, so thank you. Yeah, preferably we, but in an emergency situation, we can't. Right. I mean, if it's an emergency, it's an emergency. So yeah. thank you. I appreciate you. Yeah, welcome. And did you find your thing? No, it's not on there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's there. No, I was just messing with you. Okay, I'll keep looking. <laughs> no, you can keep looking. You're not going to find it. We just talk about it in person so I can show you specifically. Okay, thank you. It's better that way. All right, have a good day and I will see you tomorrow or the next day. Have a good one, thank you.